right. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host over here in the corner, <laughs> um, Krista Porter here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. Um, we broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show and post it to our website site in our archives, and I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can see all of our archives. Both the live show and the archives are free and open to anyone to watch, so uh, definitely share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anybody you think might be interested in any of our topics on the show. Uh, we do a mixture of things here on Encompass Lives, book reviews, interviews, uh, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, uh, basically anything that we think may have interest to libraries. And um, as the Nebraska Library Commission, we are the state agency for all libraries in the state. And so there can be things for all types of libraries, public, academic, K-12, museums, correctional facilities, we've, we've had it all on the show. Um, we do have Nebraska Library Commission staff that do presentations. Things are specific to Nebraska. Um, we also bring in guest speakers um, to do all sorts of things. And we have a mixture of that actually here today. And um, I think that um, today we're going to be talking about, as you can see on the screen, Library Innovation Studios, the Commission's currently running um, grant program about makerspaces. That's a short version. We'll get all the light details. I'll just hand over to you guys to okay, introduce great. who all is here today. Um, if you want to take some notes, can. Thank you so much, Krista. But right next to right here is Mary Jo Ryan, who's the Communications Coordinator here at the Nebraska Library Commission. She's going to start us off. Yeah, well, thanks, Krista. Krista's our engineer and, uh, our engineer and uh, extraordinaire. Uh -huh. um, I'm Mary Jo Ryan. I'm here at the Library Commission. I'm the Communications Coordinator. And Joanne? And I'm Joanne McManus. I'm the Project Manager for the Library Innovation Studio and also with the Nebraska Library Commission. I'm Heather St. Clair, and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library, and we finished hosting the Innovation Studios uh, just this last April. I'm Max Wheeler. I'm with the University of Nebraska in the Nebraska Innovation Studio. I'm the instructional designer uh, hired specifically on for this grant. Yeah. Audrey, where are you? Audrey, are you muted? Yeah. I'm Audrey Heil, and I'm from uh, Loop City Public Library, and we just finished our hosting cycle also. And we also have Connie Hancock, who will be joining us in a little bit, and she's with uh, Nebraska Extension. So let's get started. All right. Partners. Yes. And first of all, even though we are talking about a grant project that the Nebraska Library Commission got, and of course, shares in partnership uh, with a lot of partners, even if you're not part of this project, we're We'll have a lot of information about makerspaces and libraries and what they can do. And so, and of course, we have a lot of resources that we also share with other libraries. So, either way, hopefully, this is a good session for everybody. Uh, but I do want to mention the Institute of Museum and Library Services. That's who we got our uh, grant from. And of course, um, Nebraska Extension, University of Nebraska, Nebraska Innovation Studio, and the Nebraska Library Commission. And the regional systems are all. Uh, matching that grant with a lot of time and effort. <laughs> we put in a lot of time. Okay, so uh, today's agenda, we have, uh, we're going to be talking about the project overview, the application process, um, because we do, we'll be getting more uh, public libraries in Nebraska involved in the project. Oh, Connie's going to be talking to us about the community engagement process and we'll Teams. Max will say a little um, talk about the equipment in the studios and how all that works as far as training. Uh, both Audrey and Heather will be sharing their local library experiences, and then uh, Mary Jo is going to be telling us about online resources. And we'll have time at the end for questions. And it might take a little longer than I always think. It might, but we'll we'll try to stay as close to an hour as we can. But um, just to reiterate what Krista said earlier, if you have questions as we're going along, don't wait for the question and answer period. Go ahead and chat, type in the chat box, either type your question or type that you want to be unmuted so you can ask your question over your microphone. Because we don't necessarily want to wait till then, but we will have that time to get, right? Yes. Yes. Oh. Whoops. Okay, thank you. Okay. Oh, 
Okay, the Library Innovation Studios project interview, our project overview. <laughs> Joanne kind of caught me by surprise there. I thought we were just going to be chatting for a while, but I got a page. Um, as you as you mentioned, Joanne, we have a national leadership grant from Institute of Museum and Library Sciences or Library Services, um, and basically this grant is to create these temporary maker spaces that are hosted by public libraries supporting community engagement, supporting participatory learning experiences, and providing access to really um, advanced technological and innovative learning tools that wouldn't necessarily be available locally to the library or to the general public in the community in any way. Um, this three-year project. We'll be working on this till summer of 2020, and there'll be 30 of these makerspaces over that period of time. And the, one of the things that we think is a big feature of this is it allows the community to sort of try it before you buy it. And that means that you get a chance to see what it's like to have this kind of a resource in the community and see what kind of an educational experience it provides for the community and what kind of benefits. And not only try it before you buy it, because obviously if you're looking to buy a, a 3D printer or a laser cutter, it might be kind of nice to try one out and see if you know, that's robust enough for you or if you want something better. But also I think it allows your community to see, wow, this is what we want. Whereas when you're just talking about a maker space, sometimes you just don't get it until you visualize it, see it in action. Absolutely, absolutely. And how it can actually benefit a community. You might see it and then you think, well, what good is this? And then all of a sudden you see how a small business gets a real boost from being able to have these kinds of resources. So really, it's, I, we think it's a great tool for community development. Um, and three goals guide the Library Innovation Studios Makerspace project. Um, one is that rural community residents are empowered with tools and guidance to explore, collaborate, create, learn, invent, and grow together. And then the other is that libraries, along with local partners, can transform rural communities through participatory learning spaces. Also establishing the library as a community catalyst. That's real important to us in the Library Commission is we see the library's role as very strong in the area of helping the community grow and, and change. And so we think this is one of the ways that this can happen. And then uh, this might not be as important to all of you as it is to uh, perhaps our funder, but our funding agency really did think it was important that libraries and communities nationwide learn from what you do here in Nebraska. So rural communities all over the country will be looking at this as a possible replicable model. And later in, in June, we're actually going to be present at um, the Nation of Makers, Maker Space in, in the Washington, D.C. And so we're already starting to share what we've been doing in Nebraska. Yeah, and, and we think there's a lot of other rural libraries that are going to hop on the same way and look to their, their community extension and uh, their universities for support for this kind of uh, network of, of resources for their communities. So what we see is that we're going to establish community action teams in 30 rural and small communities. We hope to, we have already purchased the equipment and the components for four rotating studios. Now we hope to, to deploy all of those. Um, we're going to develop and have begun developing instructional materials and the certification process. Certification process is separate from librarian certification. This is certification for your library customers so that when they come in, they get certified on a machine and they're able to say, whenever they go to any library maker space in Nebraska, they can say, you can look me up, I know how to use that sewing machine. They don't have to be trained every time. Um, they, we're going to employ sustainability strategies to hope hopefully see uh, new permanent innovation studios all across the state as a result of this and provide equipment training um, that I mentioned focusing on train the trainer strategies and that basically is a group training here in Lincoln at the Nebraska Innovation Studio prior to each cycle and then local train the training sessions that are held in the library prior to each uh, setup right and Max will talk a little bit about that later Okay, so we're going to assist with local marketing and programming and event planning for your 19 to 20 week hosting period. And um, that varies a little bit, doesn't it, Joanne? It just depends on when we can get out there and when the training is convenient for you. And if there's a holiday weekend, it messes things up. So we just try to work. Joanne has to be the master of the flexibility and rearrange things to work around those hosting periods. But we try and make it as convenient as possible for you and your local community and your trainers. 
And then we have uh, programming and focus areas that we try to encourage, such as, as I mentioned, the, uh, the embroidery social sewing machine. Say you have a uh, quilting group in your community, you would invite them in to do some special programming. Maybe they get interested. Some of them would want to be trainers. That's the kind of thing we try to do is encourage local people who have that kind of an interest to come in and, and work with the equipment, um, as well as just anybody, any local library customer that comes in. Schedule trainings, obviously, that's something the libraries do. They schedule trainings all the way through the hosting cycle. Some of them wait a few weeks until the library staff and volunteers are really comfortable with the equipment. Open houses, and then local maker showcases. And then each year we're going to have an annual inventor showcase. This year we're going to be at the Nebraska State Fair, right? Yes, we are. We're not sure which day. Well, actually, we're August thinking August. of Sunday, August 26th. Sunday, August 26th sounds like but, a great day to be at the State Fair. What do you think? Yep. <clears throat> but definitely watch our website because that's that's the, so that's the change. That's the date. So that's, <laughs> that's the date that Fred and I are talking about. So okay. We'll see. And that's always a challenge. I don't know if any of you have ever worked the state fair as opposed to going to it, but it is a long day. <laughs> you need a lot of people to work that. Joanne, you want to talk about that application process if I can get to that slide? There I, go. I sure do. Now, uh, we've already selected 17 libraries. Uh, we will be selecting our final 13 libraries uh, this summer. The application deadline is July 20th. So that is, that's a little, a little less than two months away. So you definitely, if you're interested in applying, definitely start working toward that. Um, the application and the answers to questions is on our website. So you can download that. If you have any questions at all, give us a call. I will be glad to help. But there's so much information on the website. So, and we'll go to the website in a, in a little bit, kind of just show you so you can walk through it a little bit so you can see where stuff is. We'll be talking more about the website. Okay, so which libraries are eligible? We really did write this grant to IMLS to talk about uh, small and rural libraries, but as um, when you look at that nationwide, they really look at uh, small libraries as anything less than 25,000. So really, every public library who's accredited in Nebraska is eligible other than our six largest cities. So that pretty much opens it nearly all the communities. Um, we, the, the studio does have to be housed within the public library and certainly in communities there are plenty of other wonderful spaces for maker spaces, but because we got this grant through IMLS, um, it, and we said it's gonna be a public library, so that's really where it needs to be. However, when you're looking at uh, sustaining it in your community, it might be that your community college or some other place in your community might be um, a good spot for that as well. You do must have, have adequate space to available for those six permanent stations to remain installed throughout the hosting period. If you are short on space, um, out of the 13 libraries, we will be selecting two libraries that will be sharing the equipment and we call those mini studios. And so essentially, if you don't have quite enough room for the whole studio, we'll bring in half the studio for the first 10 weeks and then swap it with the other mini studio library. And then you'll host the other half of the equipment. So if you're a little tight on space, that's how we'll handle that. And we'll be talking to Audrey, who a little bit later, who had a mini studio. Right. Audrey was in uh, Luke City with a mini studio. And so she can address how that works in their community. Um, and definitely read, uh, if you're thinking about applying, definitely read the question, answers to questions document online because that asks a lot of questions and answers those questions. So it gives you a little bit of feel about um, the commitment and how everything really works. Okay, so there are definitely benefits to participation. Um, we... Uh, you'll have um, have access to community engagement training tools, templates, and support. Support and Connie will talk a little bit about that. You'll have the studio components for 19 to 20 weeks. Um, Mary Jo already mentioned the try it before you buy it. That's certainly a benefit to you. 
the community will see those benefits and go, hey, we can do this. And I think uh, both Heather and uh, Audrey will talk about maybe what they're thinking about as far as do they want some of this equipment in the future that they have a taste for. Uh, we will have some travel support. So when your uh, trainers need to come in to LinkedIn for training or other events, um, we'll provide that for you. Obviously, you have access to wonderful staff, um, Max and the others at the Rusty Innovation Studio have a lot of experience on maker spaces and equipment. And, and they're great they're trainers. trainers. Absolutely. Yes. We've gotten really good training. In, we have a good time, don't, don't we, Heather? We yeah. have a good time at that Oh, training. yeah. And then, of course, we have, uh, we also have great staff here. Um, who's a uh, technology librarian that can help you as well. Um, you'll be have connection with the Rusk Innovation Studio, Makerspace Network, uh, talking to other libraries who've done it. And uh, at the end, since we're going to have four sets of equipment, um, the 30 libraries who participate will be eligible to receive one or more pieces of equipment. Hopefully, we can keep those equipment up and running. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, it'll still be in pristine condition by then. <laughs> okay, and of course, we do have some expectations of our participating libraries. We do uh, need the libraries to organize a community action team and, lo and engage local organizations. Obviously, when you get a grant, um, the one of the things that the funders are always looking for is there any sort of sustainability involved. And so, if the, even though a library could do it alone, and do wonderful work if the community isn't back behind them and involved. Uh, is that library going to be able to uh, come up with the funds and the staffing to support a makerspace? Well, and especially this kind of a makerspace project, because this one really hinges on the community engagement. I mean, you, you could put a makerspace in a school, for example, and it might not ever really have a community component, but this kind of a makerspace, we really feel like the community engagement is, is, is huge. Um, you'll need to identify staff and recruit volunteers to attend the train trainer sessions, uh, both in LinkedIn and then at, in your community. Uh, you will need, to, even though we'll be bringing in the equipment, you'll need to have the space, make sure you have sturdy tables, chairs, workspace. It's so not only space for the equipment, but, you know, gathering space as well. So when uh, people come in and start working, there's room for that. Uh, you'll need to do some marketing, and uh, Mary Jo and Tessa will help you along the way with that. Uh, obviously, you may need to make the studio components available to the public on a regular basis. You just can't put them in the media room and have it only open one hour a day. <laughs> one hour a day. Um, train people, uh, use the certification database, maintain the consumables that you bring in. Um, showcase, you know, have the open house to showcase and other things. So there is work involved. And uh, maybe Heather and uh, Audrey will say whether that was a big issue or just another day of the office. <laughs> <laughs> a little most. <laughs> a little most, yeah. Okay, um, when you go online and find our application, you'll see that uh, the features of the application, again, obviously we're asking for basic contact information. There is an assurance checklist because we want to be sure that you are committed to doing certain things and we'll uh, have a slide on that in a little bit. There's uh, 10 basic um, questions for you to answer and we would like to also see um, sketches and diagrams and photos of the space that you plan on using for the studio station so we can kind of be assured that you really do have space for it. And then we would like you to also attach those letters of support and commitment from local partners. That could be the school, the community college, um, local businesses, uh, your extension educators, who else? Chamber of Commerce. Yeah, did you, who did you, did you check to? Um, the local school district, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, um, of course, the library uh, board and foundation. Uh, let's see who else might 
So there's a couple other ones. I'm going to take a look at my application to see who all I asked. And of, and of course, Connie is going to be talking about that community engagement. So. And Audrey, did you have any other groups that you reached out to that were particularly useful in, in getting... We have we have an um, entrepreneur group here. It's not very big, but we, they just started, and they were interested in it. And then we also had um, the Sherman County Economic Development Group. Um, but the school played a huge part um, yeah. because we're a, you know, our county and school libraries are together, so they pay, played a huge part. Great. And then um, we'll just, we won't go through this assurance list. Um, but on the next slide, all right, Joe. Okay. Then, uh, so you'll see on the application that we actually ask you to check yes that you are willing to do all these things, and it's all things that we just went over. That you're going to have people be trainers. That you're going to have those tables and chairs. That you're going to be reaching out to the community. So that's just our way of uh, kind of reminding everybody who applies that. This is kind of what's involved and what we expect. And then there is a hosting period priority form included, right? That's right. Um, and this is not required that you fill this out, um, but it is highly recommended. And we, I will eventually ask you to fill it out. Uh, but the people who fill it out and send it in right away with their application, um, you are just basically telling us of the hosting periods available, which which ones do you prefer, and you can put them in order of your preference. So when we select those 13, we'll look at who sent in this hosting form, and we'll all say, we'll already say, okay, um, this community um, is ready to go for this time, it seems to work, and so we're gonna slot them in. And so definitely fill that out if you can, and um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, what you need to do there. And then those are these are the hosting um, periods that are open. So you can see we, the very first one that the new 13 communities could select is the one that starts February 11, 2019. So we're all filled up until then. We're all filled up until then. And then we go through the week of March 30th, 2020. Right. Okay. And um, You'll notice that each are about 19 weeks long. Those are subject to a little bit of change just because um, when we actually get down to sliding people in, it could change slightly. But that's what we're looking at right now. Um, there are, we've already selected uh, 17 libraries. Um, our first group included Loop City and Ashland, who's here to talk today talking with us. So we already have been in five communities. Currently, if you want to get out and look at one of our library innovation studios, head out to South to Neely, Broken Bow, and Bridgeport, because that's where those studios are now. Uh, and then you can see those other communities uh, that will be in cycle three and four, and then Nebraska City chose a later cycle. And so um, but we are really excited to choose another 13 public libraries. Can't wait to see who they're going to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a, a, a slide that, that kind of starts out a presentation from Connie Hancock from the Rescue Extension. And are you there, Connie? I am. Good morning. Good morning. I'll try and keep up with you with the slides. So oh, okay. how do the project goals overlap with our community goals? Um, well, they definitely, am I getting an echo from you guys? A tiny bit. I wonder what we can do about that. Okay. 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 Well, definitely the uh, project goals overlap with community goals as we think about um, attracting and retaining young people, uh, providing opportunities for our youth um, in a variety of ways to create and innovate and be entrepreneurs in our communities so that they, they learn how to um, invent something or innovate something with the idea that um, potentially they can have us create their own startup. And so as you look at the, the project goals, um, we're empowering people to learn how to collaborate and network and learn from each other. 
um, that's really the cool thing about the makerspace is um, how would you do this? This is how I'm doing it kind of thing. Uh, the whole idea of entrepreneurship and business development. Um, think about economic development in a whole different way um, as we grow our own um, next generation of entrepreneurs and startups. And, you know, the Federal Reserve Board has said today that now is the time for people to start businesses. Um, everything is right in terms of um, our, our um, the economics that are around us and the support that we have and the support for local. And so that's really a, a part of all of that. Makerspaces definitely provide us with lifelong learning and education, and that's what we want to continue to provide our clientele and our communities and the people that live, uh, work, and play in our um, communities. And then the whole initiative of STEAM, um, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. So it's really thinking differently about how we do economic development, thinking about how we reach out to community uh, folks and bring that knowledge to that space. And that really fits in with community goals as well. So uh, Connie, if you would talk a little bit, we've been talking, mentioning community engagement, but if you would talk a little bit more about what that means for libraries and the organizations that they partner with. Absolutely, you know, um, none of us can do this by, us, by ourselves. And so uh, we all bring resources, we all bring expertise, we all bring talent to the table in the makerspace environment. And so working as a catalyst um, and having the library be that center point, um, we can get more people involved in projects, we can get more people uh, working together on um, a variety of things, and we can utilize their talent so that they really feel good about themselves. So that's really that whole engagement piece is reaching out to people that have never been to the library maybe just because of, uh, you know, of what they are and who they are. But now they've got a set of tools, a set of um, a space where they can really do some creative kinds of things. And so that's our job is to really help empower them to be more um, than who they are today. And it also helps build a sense of community because oftentimes the school system or extension or the library, we kind of end up in our own little silos thinking that we can do it all. When in fact, um, if we reach out and utilize those folks in a variety of ways, it just, it really just makes it way more than um, what we are today. And so that's part of that building of, of a sense of community and meeting people who are doing something different than we are. So you think about um, the kinds of skills that somebody else knows, and I may have wanted to do that at some point in time, but I don't wanna drive 50 miles to a class. Well, there may be somebody in your community that can help teach that class or to help you develop that skill. Um, and and that's what, that whole concept of learning from each other is where that fits in. Um, understanding the benefits of what a makerspace means to the community. Um, we, we have created Sydney Create, where um, it's, it's our makerspace concept. We've been in the conversation for about three years until we got our grant to be able to actually create the physical space in the library. But the benefits are really starting to show. I mean, the youth are um, extremely excited about the um, use of the makerspace and we're utilizing the STEM kinds of activities to teach them about the science, technology, engineering. And we're utilizing adults who already have that knowledge base to be the, the trainers of that. And so we've now expanded our um, volunteer base for, I mean, we've trained about 25 people now from an adult perspective and a youth perspective to, to train others. And so that's really kind of a cool way, generational um, as well as economic development wise. Um, and I think the, the real key to this community engagement is having a strong community action team. So if you look around your community and find the leaders who really get what a makerspace has to offer and the benefits that it has to offer, people from the Chamber of Commerce, economic development. Um, of course, I'm gonna promote extension because we, we um, have a, a variety of resources from the university as well as then the connection with Nebraska Innovation Studio. And I'm utilizing those guys all the time of 
it's not working quite right. Can you help me figure this or that out? So that's really um, a nice connection between uh, the local extension um, educator and the, the resources that we have on campus. So think about who those action team people are. Marketing is another part of this whole engagement thing of getting the word out that this is what is available in your community and this is what we um, have to offer uh, during this time frame. So think about how marketing and who has those skills of being able to market and articulate the message in a way that um, community folks really understand. And so it's then identifying that um, training team that goes along with that action. As I mentioned, we've got 25 people now who are trained and people are coming in and out of the library that had never been in the library before. So it's really the library staff in Sydney is really excited about the, um, the new faces and the connections that they're making and um, just seeing the kinds of work that people are creating. It's, it's been really a, a fun project as well as um, utilizing the talents that we have locally. And then you also do a, a local training team that gets developed as well too, which may or may not be the same people as that are on your community action team, right? That's that's correct. That's absolutely right. And we've been um, we've had a couple of actual meetups, and so we're in the mindset of now we do a Tinker Tuesday, um, and so every Tuesday afternoon uh, from three to five we're um, just we have a, a little bit of an activity going on, but if people just want to come and tinker, um, that's kind of where we're at. So here is, again, the list of the action team folks, which is different than the trainers, um, because you need that core group of people to say, okay, this isn't really working. We need to maybe change some of the guidelines. Um, you know, that was what our action team identified was how much are we going to charge. Now, I know that's not what you guys need uh, within this particular grant, but if you're going to make this sustainable in the long run, after you've had the rotating makerspace, you're going to need to learn about or think about um, what this looks like and, you know, what about the youth? Do they need to be supervised? And how much time are we going to allow people to um, spend at that, et cetera, et cetera. So just a framework of um, some guidelines of the use of the space. So again, here, here is that list of uh, community action people. Um, they need to have a, it's kind of like a board, but we, we haven't gone that deep into saying we need bylaws and all that stuff. Um, we have utilized the, um, um, the agreement piece that the library commission recommends of, you know, getting hurt and this kind of thing. Um, but it, it's people that are willing to spend some time and energy strategically thinking about creating an implementation plan and what that longer term piece means for your community. It may mean some fundraising. Um, it may mean collaborating with other stakeholders in your community to get that done. Um, recruiting um, others uh, and their organizations and continually talking about the makerspace as a whole um, new concept for the community. It's a, it's a much bigger thing than, than who we are today. And then again, finding those resources, whether they're financial, human um, ideas, um, it, it doesn't matter, but really trying to empower people in a new kind of way to do some things that are very unique. And um, it's just an exciting time for those libraries and those communities that are hosting the um, um, mobile makerspace. So these were some action steps that we initially identified, um, a volunteer coordinator, getting people involved in the conversations, uh, keeping people engaged. Um, as I mentioned, the role of marketing is really key so that you don't, you, you spread the word in a variety of ways. Um, maintaining the momentum, um, whether that's scheduling some tinker time or some meetups where people can say, I've been using the vinyl cutter and this isn't working, this isn't working, but this is working for me. Um, how do you do this? How do you do that? So meetups are another way that um, the action team can be involved. And then celebrating your success with some sort of a, a local maker showcase or an inventor's fair, um, something like that. So those are all pieces of what the action team can be involved with. Well, thank you, Connie. I know you have to get back to another event, 
or activity, but I would like to just open the floor for questions for Connie. Um, this would be the time if you could, if you want to catch her and ask her any questions about how to reach out to your local extension agent or extension educator or any other kind of thing about what's happening at Sydney Create, which is their local uh, makerspace project with the library. And Connie, you might also want to mention how um, extension educators um, in Nebraska are, you know, ready to assist when um, libraries get there, get this makerspace out there. Absolutely, you know, with the um, Nebraska 4-H program, uh, many of our youth educators are already doing STEM kinds of activities. So the makerspace just allows us um, a little bit more advanced um, uh, tools that we can um, get the, the youth trained in and then train adults as 4-H uh, leaders as well. So definitely the extension folks are, are, are getting much more aware of what the maker space has to offer to them as they provide educational opportunities for the youth and adults in their communities. And I think the first round of um, libraries, everybody was a little bit, I'm already booked, you know, I've got my, my programming out there, but now we're starting to have those conversations with our educators that are saying, oh, this is really kind of cool. We can do this and this and this. And, and the more that we network with each other across the state, um, the more powerful that makes the not only the educational uh, programming and opportunities, but then what we can offer to the libraries um, and the library staff. And uh, also, the, the um, extension educators have an initiative which relates to community engagement, right? Yes, yes. We've got both the community engagement piece as well as, you know, the youth education piece. So there's a double whammy there, Mary Jo, that, the, that we're definitely involved with. And um, if you have questions or if your educator is not real sure about this, I would be glad to visit with them. Um, Joanne and Mary Jo, all the, the, the library commission has my contact information and I'd be glad to visit with you as a library uh, director or staff person, as well as uh, the local extension educator, because it is kind of a new concept for us, although the word is getting out more and more about what this has to offer. We visited last week, Brad Barker and I, with um, several libraries that are getting the makerspace now, and the, one of the gals from the very first cycle said, I want it back, I, I now know what I now know what it has to offer to me as an educator, and can I get it back someday? And so, um, that it's it's one of those things that once once you're involved with it and get your hands on it, it's like wow, this is really cool stuff. Thank you, Connie. Um, actually, we do have a question. Um, Audrey, go ahead and ask your question since you're there, and I've got you unmuted now. <laughs> um, we actually had. I had some questions about how you communicated to the community what you have, what it could do. Um, we used our local paper, the Facebook page, posters around town. We talked to community groups. We put uh, posters in school and I sent emails to teachers and I still had people at the end of the hosting period say, I didn't know you had that. I didn't know what that could do. What worked for you to communicate to people? Well, it's, this, it's, you know, I think Audrey word of mouth is probably the best of all of it. Um, we, we did the same things that you did, newspaper, Facebook. Um, we actually um, did a um, teacher in service. The principal of the high school brought all 200 teachers into the makerspace at the beginning of the school year. And so that really helped the teachers think about some opportunities that they might do with their youth during the school school year. You know, you're fortunate that you were right there in the school, but you know, I, I don't know how, I think the more, one of the lessons that I learned early on was seven times in seven different ways. So take those seven different ways and get the message out seven different times. Um, it, marketing is a hard one in today's world with there's so much mass stuff that's coming at us every day. So I think you did the right things and there's always going to be somebody that says, huh, my head was in the sand. Where was I at? <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think the key thing when you say, Connie, is that you've been at this for three years in your community. Mm -hmm. You've been yep. building your community team 
Now your community team has been communicating and learning and trying things out for three years. Yeah. So that's a one big of, one. Yeah, that's one of the things that we are doing is capturing everybody that comes through the makerspace, we're capturing their email contact information and I'm putting together a newsletter. I'm trying to get it so that it goes out monthly. So we know, we just share, here are some training dates. Here is the member of the month kind of a thing that if there's somebody that has really done some cool stuff, created some cool stuff, we do a member spotlight. Um, and then just bits of information about makerspaces. So we've been using MailChimp, it's a free, um, you know, email um, mass marketing uh, tool, and um, we're just gradually building that up. I think we have 50 or 60 names on it now, but that will, over time, will um, uh, hopefully be more than, you know, 500 names, even just locally. So it's just one of those things that you got to keep working at it, and I, I do think word of mouth is probably the best. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. We just wanted to, to mention, I mean, are there any other questions first? No, not at the moment. If you do, anyone does have questions, use the question section of your GoToWebinar interface. You can type in there, and I'm monitoring it all right here on the laptop. I can see what you say. We just wanted to mention that we do have uh, some resources on our uh, community engagement section of our website. Um, and you can see we've got the, this welcome webinar, or a welcome webinar that's similar to this. We've got templates for helping you build your teams and planning events. We have a timeline that helps keep us all sort of in the same page and a general information PowerPoint. And later in, at the very end of this session, we're gonna to go to that website and just point some things out for you so you can see where things are. And then of course you can go back to the website anytime you want and just peruse it, find whatever you're looking for that might be helpful. Okay. Good. Thank you, Connie, for joining us. I know you're in the middle of something else, but we really appreciate having you here. Thank you. Yep. Well, thank, thank you very much. And again, uh, reach out to the Library Question Commission if you have questions for me. I'll be glad to um, help you out. Thank you. Thanks, Connie. I'm going to turn things over to Max Wheeler. He'll talk a little bit about what kind of equipment is in uh, studios and a little bit more about training. Yeah. So uh, we've been talking a lot about the details of how the program works, uh, how you can apply everything, uh, but what all does it actually include? So what machines, what equipment, uh, and we've got a total of 15 different stations. Uh, six of them we have that are we consider more permanent. Uh, they're set up and people go to them. We also have nine mobile stations that are a little more uh, transportable. They're a little lighter. Uh, so those are easier for people to pick up and move wherever they happen to be working. Uh, our first section is the digital fabrication. I call these the big four because aside from being really versatile, they're also the biggest. Um, they're, they tend to be pretty big and heavy. Going from the left there uh, over to the right, we have our 3D printer, which creates objects out of plastic. Uh, you see them making everything from cute little things that you put on your desk to functional prototypes of new products, new designs, new parts. Uh, Switches for things that break. There you go. <laughs> uh, to the right of that is our CNC router. It's capable of cutting through about an inch of wood, creating two-dimensional, three-dimensional designs. Uh, we see a lot of people making signs uh, and decorations on that one. The upper right is probably, I would say, the most popular piece of equipment with this grant. Uh, it's our desktop laser. It's capable of cutting about one quarter inch of wood. It etches glass. It can uh, work a whole variety of materials. We see a bunch of people making signs, decorations, gifts, uh, anything you can imagine on this. Uh, one really neat thing we've seen people do is cut fabric on this. We'll have quilters that'll come in and they're used to cutting designs by hand, which takes a really long time. Uh, you can do it in no time at all on this laser and get accurate, perfect results every single time. Uh, we also have our GraphTech 60 inch wide, or sorry, not 60, it's a 24 inch wide uh, vinyl cutter. This is really good for making signs, decorations, wall hangings, wall art, uh, things of that nature. With all of these uh, and all of the equipment that we have later on, we do also have software for each of them. Uh, we teach you how to use the software, get you up and running on it, uh, and then also provide you with a lot of resources online for you know, if I have a question on this, how do I master this software, that sort of stuff. 
Uh, next section is the electronics. We have everything from Lego Mindstorms, which is you know a little more blocky, you know, plug this into that, uh, all the way up to our Arduino and SparkFun kits, which are you know, at their core microelectronics. Uh, for people that are really interested in learning microelectronics, this is a really good way to get started. Uh, you know, it comes with everything that you need to create some simple circuits, all the way up to some pretty advanced things, uh, trying them out, learning all things of that nature. We also have a Makey Makey, which is a really fun little toy. Uh, you use it for creating a custom interface for your computer. Uh, basically, think about it as a keyboard without the keys, and you make the keys yourself. So instead of clicking a mouse, you have a banana that whenever you touch it, it clicks on the computer mouse. Uh, and you can set up a whole wide array of things and create a really custom interface that can be really fun. Uh, on the next slide, we've got our textiles. The big one here is the embroidery sewing machine. It is a fully capable sewing machine. It also has an embroidery machine that is, I want to say, around five inches by six inches. It comes preloaded with a bunch of designs, and we also have a bunch of designs on the computers that we've got bought separately for that product, that device. Uh, really, really great stuff. We've seen some awesome things made on this. Uh, actually, I think over in Ashland, we had some people making teddy bears mm -hmm. that were embroidered yep. uh, before they were all sewn together. So they had some really neat designs on them. Uh, and the heat press is really oh, useful. And I wanted to mention that the yes. uh, sewing machine, it was the sewing machines, all four yes. of them, were donated by uh, one of our, our very special Bernina donors. It's the Quality Sew and Back of Grand Island. Mm -hmm. Those are fantastic machines. Uh, the heat press that we have is good for making uh, designs on shirts, fabric, anything else that you'd like. Uh, the printers that we have there, depending on the material, may need a certain kind of ink. Uh, so those two printers cover a very wide array of different kinds of materials that you can then heat press your design onto at the next step. Our digital media creation includes a uh, Canon EO5. Not a a really good, really capable camera. It comes with a bunch of different lenses, uh, a bunch of different accessories for that camera, tripod, carrying case. Uh, we also have a green screen, as well as the software to remove that green screen digitally and insert whatever you'd like to in the background. A uh, whole bunch of stuff that we have there. We have a music and recording kit that includes uh, a fully uh, programmable MIDI controller, as well as all of the stuff that you would need to bring whatever you're working with into a computer. We also have the software Audacity and Reaper that allows you to modify, play with, adjust the levels, uh, and fully record and fully adjust what you need. We've seen a lot of people use this also for podcasting. Um, so not just for music, but also for voice recordings. We also have kind of a, a swath of other devices here. Uh, the laminator has been a really popular piece of equipment. We've seen a couple of places actually purchase that specific laminator because they liked it so much. Uh, we have a button maker along with some of the die cuts that make that a little bit easier. Uh, we have a glue gun, we have Corel Draw, we have a couple other odds and ends here. Uh, so really a, a whole wide array of things covering all sorts of different topics and interests. The six permanent stations that we talked about before are all listed here along with the Kind of floor space that they take up. If you're trying to plan, you know, where you want to put all these things, uh, this is going to be really helpful for you as far as laying all that out. We have seen some maker spaces where they were all in one room. Ashland, for example, had one space where everything was uh, all really easy to locate. We've also seen other libraries where they were spread out. You know, this section maybe had the laser, this section had the vinyl cutter and the router, uh, and you know, we made use of the space that was available. But as you're planning, uh, keep that in mind that this is going to be really helpful for you. We've also alluded to uh, the train the trainers and the uh, local training that we have. To give you a brief overview of that, basically the train the trainers is the very first event where people from your community that you've identified as potential trainers, library staff, uh, they'll come to Lincoln and we will train on every single piece of equipment. Uh, that's not to say that every person trains on every piece, but uh, someone from your library should be trained on uh, you know, each of the things by the end of it. Uh, after that time, we will go and take down the equipment from a previous site and install it at your site. We'll stay there for you know, two to three days, install, uh, teach you how to use the equipment, teach you how to do some maintenance on the equipment, uh, and make sure that you're comfortable before we actually leave town. Uh, after that time, 
and we've we talked about it a little bit. After that time, we are still available uh, technically, you know, online, uh, phone, email for support as questions come up as things arise, uh, because we know that they do arise, <laughs> stuff happens, uh, and so you know, we may only be there in person for two or three days, but we're definitely there electronically all the time. Uh, we do have SOPs, standard operating procedures, that we include for all of our equipment to teach you how to run it, uh, give you a brief update and an overview. Maybe you forgot how to do the specific process on this machine. That's a good way to uh, get up to speed on that. We uh, also have training videos for our big four. Uh, we're always expanding that and adding more. They give you a brief overview of what this machine is capable of and how to kind of roughly run it, how to get some decent results. Uh, we use those as kind of a homework. So when people are, uh, you know, they're gonna take a training in a week here, I'd ask them to watch this video to get a brief overview of how that machine works before they actually sit down and participate in it. Uh, and so again, we have some more opportunities for learning after we're gone. Uh, we have the scheduled trainings uh, that the library is actually responsible for setting up, scheduling, deciding who is going to be teaching them, when they'll be teaching them, uh, opportunities for people to become certified on it. Uh, and we do really like to push the interest groups. Also, uh, you know, the kind of local things that may already be there. If, uh, there's already a quilter group that's there. Uh, go ahead, bring them in, show them how to use the laser, show them how to uh, get their designs digitized and be able to be produced on there. Uh, and you know we've got all sorts of other things that we have seen work well, uh, and we can provide some guidance and some help on there. So with that, uh, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Heather to talk about her experiences with the first cycle. Thanks, Max. Yeah, uh, yeah it was a really exciting uh, couple, few months. Uh, we we got the equipment, and uh, uh, when we finally got it, we did take a week and a half to get our trainers comfortable with the machines to the point uh, to where they could train people. Um, uh, that, that was a big thing. Uh, for a long time, I was the only one who was comfortable training on the embroidery machine. Um, and uh, But we didn't have anybody who trained uh, everybody on everything. We had uh, groups of people who would train on different groups of equipment. Um, and then we did have some overlap too, depending on what they wanted to do. We did have one volunteer that we had who was part of our, uh, he's the president of our, our foundation. And uh, he, he just loved the equipment and he learned pretty much every piece of it. You can actually see him, he's the, he's the guy working on the sewing machine. <laughs> Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, we met him. He came. He came to Carney too, right? Uh, I don't. I don't know if he went. Maybe not. Maybe that was at the. Maybe we met him at the innovation studio. Could be. Um, but uh, he he learned a lot of the equipment so well that he could do things that uh, that he would then train other people on. He was able to uh, print something out uh, with the heat press uh, printers on uh, the designs for those, and then get the vinyl cutter to cut it out before he heat pressed it onto a t-shirt. Um, he created a three-dimensional replica of the cover art of Where the Sidewalk Ends by Shel Silverstein out of um, a 3D printed uh, kids and the, and the cliff that they're on and attached it to a laser cut and laser etched background that had all the signs and then final cut where the sidewalk ends and then if so it's this, wow. this fantastic piece <laughs> that he sounds was, really cool he was really good at, at using uh, make a lot sure of he materials. brings that to the state fair yeah. the inventors fair we want to see it and um, i like that you mix and match all the pieces of equipment yes with one final mm -hmm. thing it's yeah. not just use one thing for one yeah, yeah, you can yeah mix it up. Well, and the and the the bears that, that Max was talking about earlier, um, the fabric was uh, cut on the laser cutter and then embroidered on the embroidery machine, and then sewn together with it, and then uh, it had a bow that was a polyester white ribbon that had been heat pressed with a design on it using the sublimation printer. Um, so we had we had people, you know, would just make one thing with one piece of equipment, and we'd have people who'd make things with, with multiple pieces of equipment. Um, so it was it was a lot of fun to see what people created. And and I think one of the biggest hurdles we had to, initially was, you know, what do I what do I use this for? 
what do I do with this equipment? So it was nice to also take that week and a half to, to practice some for ourselves, but we also created things that we can then show people and say, look, this is, this is some of the stuff that you can make. And we had people come in and just to, to make things that we didn't even, we didn't even imagine because we, we posted pictures on Facebook and people would go, oh, you have this thing. Um, we also <laughs> did get a big rush at the end too of people who were like, well, I need to learn everything. And, <laughs> I didn't, you know, we didn't have enough time, and so, um, yeah, I think everybody will get that big rush at, at the end. So does that uh, big rush at the end, does that give any kind of momentum towards uh, getting something started right there in your community? Yes, I think it, I think it really did. Um, it, it, we got people involved in the community action team that weren't in the original team because yeah. they had... They had learned about the the makerspace while it was there, and and um, the rush at the end. People are like, you know, I didn't get to finish my projects. You guys need to, <laughs> you need to, you need to get something in so I can keep doing all the things that I wanted to do. Yeah, that's so, great. Yeah, and uh, I think depending on which community you have, the pieces of equipment that you have that are the most popular will vary. Though it seems pretty pretty ubiquitous that the laser cutter is the most popular and I think it's because it can cut and etch a variety of materials um, that you know but this, some of the other things can't can't do but it can both do you know a design that you can then build something with but then it can also decorate that as well and we've also seen it's because um, you know it's really easy to go from not really knowing anything to producing a really high quality result I mean we've had people yeah. that had never really touched design software at all and we're able to make some really high quality stuff. Yeah. Um, and take it home at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, and you can see the um, efficacy for like a small business uh, production. Right. Um, wow. I yeah. mean, or an entrepreneur that wants to make salsa, instead of just putting it in plain jars, you put them in etched jars. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there's a lot that could happen. Yeah, our, our local quilters group came in and they learned how to use the laser cutter, but they actually use our button maker a lot to create um, promotional materials ah, yeah. uh, to hand out to people. And uh, we had uh, some sports teams come in and had jerseys made. They used the vinyl cutter to put numbers on helmets <laughs> um, because that's just a lot of stuff. We don't, we don't have those businesses in town mm -hmm. that do that, so they usually have to go out of town to do that. So that was nice too, and it gives the opportunity for somebody to to also start that business up. But if there is something that's lacking, well, you can choose to yeah, compensate yeah. for it. Yeah. So, does anybody out there have any questions for Heather? I know we're running very close. We're at our end of our time, and I'm yeah. hoping you'll stick with us for just a few more minutes so we can talk to Audrey and also do just a few things at the end with the website. Yeah. Well, um, it is um, 11:02 by my computer here. Um, we officially show up from 10 to 11, but we'll keep going until we're through with everyone who's talking, all our slides, any questions anybody has. Um, it's all being recorded, so if you're unable to stick around with us because you only you know, gave yourself an hour to watch the show live, that's fine. We'll be able to watch the recording later and see everything, but we'll keep going until we are done. Heather, do you have anything else you wanted to add or make sure that people know about that oh. you learned or experienced? Oh, there's so much. <laughs> uh, it's, it's hard to, to, to pick the things. It's usually just the... I find it the easiest to answer people's questions. Okay, that's really your good. challenge out there. Yeah. Ask her some questions. Just chat, type it in the chat box or ask Krista to unmute you. And in the meantime, we'll go on to Audrey. If we could, please. Are you there? Yep. Yes, I am. Um, I would like to thank you guys for the experience of having the Library Innovation Studio. It was wonderful. Um, we also noticed that our community members did not really realize what a makerspace entailed or what they would be able to use the equipment for until they had the opportunity to actually have hands-on experience with it. So we had done some like Monday evening trainings and Kayla Henricks, our extension agent, um, came and did some Maker Madness um, evenings and lunch programs and that helped a lot. Um, we were surprised. Um, we had people from other towns and counties come and use the equipment who hadn't been in the library before, who are now pretty consistent patrons. So that was a good outcome. Um, and we actually did the mini studio 
um, which allowed us to keep the sound and the green screen equipment up and that allowed the classes, the teachers to bring in their classes or send in their students to do different projects without us having to, <laughs> excuse me, without us having to take everything down and take a lot of time to put it back up and and so they felt like they could come in and use it at any time and and they actually made a sherman county promotional um video and did a bunch of classwork one of our teachers mrs cremosta was amazing and had brought her older kids in but also the school librarian mrs francisco had brought her she was in charge of the after school program and so she brought her little kids in and they were able to make buttons and and um do laminated bookmarks and things that they thought you know that was really cool because they were little but they could do these things that they could then take their to their parents and show them um we i would like to stress um there was a lot of time spent so um jana our it gal at the school came in early in the mornings and helped kids start projects and um, we had some really wonderful volunteers who came in to be there for the classes. And um, it was a big time commitment. The last of the first, especially the first cycle, the last week was, there were a lot of 10 o'clock nights because you know everyone wanted their project done before, they, before the equipment left. And we had some ladies who thought they were going to go into mourning because that equipment left. They had such a good time. Um, so did you have the same experience um, that Heather talked about with maybe people thinking that, that the library needs to purchase that equipment now? We actually, we had, um, we have a wonderful school superintendent, Mr. Dahlberg and Janet um, Kushak, the IT gal, and then a couple of people on the school board who, and the teachers who used it, who really um, said, you know, it's not only important for the school, it's important for the community to have this. We've had a lot of community support. So they are actually purchasing the same 3D printer um, and the next size bigger on the laser, the 24 inch, I think it is, um, with the photo. Um, they have a, like a photo software stuff. And so they're planning on purchasing that with some community support. And it will probably be in the library. We're not sure if it'll be just in the back or if it'll be in that room where we had it set up. But that's, they've already said they were purchasing that. And I think the PTO is planning on purchasing the button maker. And the Historical Society has talked about purchasing the sound equipment so that they could do some, um, family heritage stuff. Isn't that a great idea? And, it, and Audrey, tell us about how uh, all those students wrote letters toward the end. Yes, um, Mrs. Camarosa's class, she really pushed her students and, and encouraged them to, you know, think of different things and not just, you know, what they could find on Pinterest, but make it their own. And um, they loved it and they did a fantastic job and they told her that her class was their favorite and they were already signing up for next year and couldn't wait to see what she was going to do and she's like but we won't have this equipment next year <laughs> so fortunately they will have some of that equipment now um and and uh, the students were so excited about it that they actually wrote letters um that we shared with the school board and um, and with the community and with the PTO. And I think a few of them have actually even written letters to the editor of the local paper, which I haven't seen it show up in the paper yet, but I'm guessing it will here shortly. So they were very good people to, to do the word of mouth, as Connie was saying, you know, they, they were excellent at at um, communicating it with their not only their peers but with the community at large and it means more to the community when the kids actually say you know i can say i think it's important but for the kids to say you know this made a difference and this is what i could do with this in the future that was huge dynamite yeah does anybody else out there have any questions for audrey or for heather 
Just go ahead and type in the question section if you want to know any more about what they did or any questions about anything you see on the pictures. And also, Audrey, did you have anything else you wanted to share? I, I appreciated your comments about how uh, it, it takes volunteers and it takes time and people have to go the extra mile. So I think I think that's a good, a good thing for folks to know. And our community had to be a little patient because I'm I'm just a part time librarian. And so sometimes I would be, you know, back in the room doing that stuff and they'd have to come say, OK, I'm ready to check out. But <laughs> so that's great. You get that kind of support. People so, will know that so what you're doing. People were excited enough about it that they they took it in stride. So that's great. Anything else either Audrey or Heather has to add about the experience? Um, one thing that, that Audrey said reminded me of a, a, an experience that we had uh, in our major space, which was um, that she worked a lot with the kids. And we actually had a, we normally have an after school group on Thursdays that come over and we do activities with them. And we incorporated the maker space into that. Um, and they would come and they would make buttons and they'd get to pick out heat press designs and they would get to design things and then we'd make it for them. Um, and that was that was a third to fifth grade range. And uh, they would actually go back to their parents and say, we need to go back because you know what I can make? I can make this and I need you to come check it out. And so we get a lot of we get a lot of adults in that way because the kids were so excited about it. And then we did partner with uh, some school groups. We had both uh, groups from our local school district and then the Waverly School District bring their STEAM groups up. Actually, one of them was actually an art group. Uh -huh. um, and then the other one was a, was a STEAM group and uh, got to work with the makerspace equipment and create things. And um, so, yeah, I really recommend if you're able to try to partner with, with the schools. And if, if you're not as lucky to be uh, in the school, uh, try to definitely get them get them down. So yeah, that's a good point. Even though Audrey's right in the school, the public library's right in the school, you can even though you're not, you can still partner with the schools. Yeah. And I know Max, that's something that the library, or not the library, the, the university innovation studio has found is that the art people are very interested in how this equipment can advance the artwork that they're doing. So that's another avenue for partnership. And, and one thing that we didn't mention about this project that people might want to know is that the Nebraska Library Commission um, does purchase and bring into the libraries uh, consumables. Patrons can also buy and bring in their own consumables to make things, but uh, we have uh, the 3D filament and the vinyl and wood, and I don't know if you guys want to comment on how that worked. I know it was probably a little hard to, you know, to store that stuff and sell that stuff. But um, but yet, as soon as somebody came in, if they wanted to make, there was, they could. Yeah, I think the, the trickiest part about the consumables is, is we would have people come in and make like one or two items, and then we'd have somebody come in and then make like 20 items, and then we're like, oh no, do we have enough for somebody else who's gonna come in and do 20 items? So yeah. that, was, that was the tricky part, was actually planning for how much how, how much of the materials that we would need because we would we'd have somebody come in and we'd get a brand new roll of vinyl and then somebody would come in and, and use almost all of it and I have to hop on the phone and be like, I need some more vinyl because uh, <laughs> somebody just did a 20 foot project. <laughs> um, so, um, and we did have a lot of people who would bring in their own stuff too, especially for the, uh, the, the laser cutter. Um, so that was, it was nice to have the wood on hand because then they didn't have to go get it and buy large pieces and then cut it down. But uh, it, a lot of people would bring in their own paper and uh, uh, acrylic. Uh, some, we had a couple of uh, metal objects that were etched that people would bring in. So, um, so yeah, it was, it was a little, it was just kind of a mixed bag of what, what people were using and what they were bringing. And so um, we were lucky enough to have some storage space in that room that, that made it easy. And uh, one of our one of our volunteers brought in a, a cart on wheels that we were able to store most of the consumables on. So that was helpful. Yeah, and our in the first cycle we didn't have it available, but in the second cycle, uh, and then of course in all the future cycles, the Cornhusker State Industries did uh, make some cabinets that 
they have on loan to us. And so the, that really helps to store a lot of the consumables. So we're uh, officially at 15 minutes over our time, and we hope you'll just stick with us a little tiny bit longer while we uh, talk a little bit about the resources that are online. Um, let me see if I can go. Oh, I should be able to do that. I know. I own it. Okay. Go on to the website. Okay. Now, this is the Nebraska Library Commission website, most of you, nlc.nebraska.gov. If you can't remember where to look, you just go in here and type innovation. Oh, why is this? There it goes. Innovation, innovation Studios Grant. And then you go to it. And you can also type in makerspaces and still find it. Yes, yeah. you can. Yeah. Or you can go over here to grants and find it that way. So there's way, different ways to find it. But there's a big reminder right on top. The final application deadline is July 20th. And then if you go down here into this green box, what you see are some of the categories of information. And we spoke about, uh, well, obviously there's a project summary, um, just a variety of materials that, that you might want. But here is where you might find the information that will help you when you're going into the application. You can see there's a Word document and a PDF. And then we have recorded webinars, we have training videos, uh, everything Matt talked about, you can see we have component, the equipment components. You want to see more about this Burnett embroidery machine. You can see more about products that it makes. We've got a little video about it. So we've tried to put as much on this website as you possibly would need. And it, we're adding to it all the time because we keep finding more things. Equipment instructions are here. The space needs chart that Matt talked about is here. We have a communications kit, which is basically all you need to have for a media kit. It's all online here. You can click on Word documents, PDFs, links to other areas. Um, obviously, this is going to be more of more interest to you once you get your grant, but this just gives you an idea of some of the kinds of things that we can help you with. But there is a big uh, a PowerPoint on there. So if you're starting to talk to local people about, can, you know, let's uh, really go for this, you can go through, you can use that PowerPoint and kind of give them an overview of what the project is all about. You can show me where it's at. I'm sorry. I, um, I, I go up, by it, didn't I? You can go up. Um, why did that Okay, I went by it too fast, didn't I? I try not to do this so fast because it makes people dizzy. It's toward the top. I, I keep going more. Just... There it is. It's at the top. General information PowerPoint. So that's for everyone to use. And like Joanne said, it will help you in your process of getting your partners lined up. What else did I miss here? Uh, community engagement. Some of the things Connie talked about are on this page. Um, the welcome webinar, the worksheets, the planning form, uh, and e a little video on community engagement. What else did I miss, you guys? Is there other stuff on this page that is useful? Um, partners well, and donors. We have to thank our partners and donors. So and this, these pages are good for not only you know understanding what it's about so you can envision what it's going to be like. But once you're actually a host library, for instance, we have uh, the SOP, Standard Operating Procedures, uh, the training videos on um, safety in, um, in a makerspace. Of course, even if you have a makerspace, and aren't even involved in our project, these are still very helpful to mm -hmm. you. Um, and Max, I don't know if you want to mention anything, you were the one who that was your brainchild there. Yeah, so these are the videos I was talking about. Uh, they're about three or four minutes. They give you an overview of what those big four machines uh, look like, what they can do, uh, and the general workflow for how you get them up and running. And uh, when we would do the training, anytime we got somebody brand new in, we would actually just show them the safety video uh -huh. right here on the page rather than uh, reinvent the wheel. So. Right. right. And we've got a new one we recorded yesterday. So, so I guess um, 
Let's just go back to our PowerPoint. Um, whoop, whoop. Question, answers, comments. I know we've kept people a little bit long, but we're happy you stuck with us. Uh, we want to be sure and, and point out that this is a partnership, which we've been talking about all this time, that the Library Commission, UNL, Nebraska Information Studio, Nebraska Extension, Regional Library Systems, and you, local public libraries, funded in part by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Thank you very much for their support. Okay. Joanne, anything you want to say for the um, group? No, uh, give give us a call if you have any questions. Um, we're happy to help. Um, apply. It's easy. Yes, we need thirty more libraries. But, but don't wait till the last minute because then when you look at those questions, it's going to say, "Have you given thought to who will be your trainers?" Like, oh my goodness, I haven't. <laughs> so read the application today and kind of decide what you need to do between now and uh, July 20 to be ready to submit that application. And you can submit it as soon as you're done. You don't have to wait till 20th, but that's the very, so we're giving you a, a month and a half head start, I mean, right now to get all your ducks in a row, figure out everything you need to do, look at those questions, yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, we had our first application period about this time last year, so many of you might, I mean, you know, the application was actually on the website uh, for that whole time. Now, I do have a question. Uh, I know we had more applications than we could take the first round. Um, if people applied in the first round, did they need to do a new one this time? Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. we, if we switched anything up from the first round. Um, sure. the, the application is essentially the same. I do have a place that says, if you want to be a mini studio, definitely tell us that that's what you're interested in. Um, but otherwise, it's pretty much the same application. But do submit um, a new one. Obviously, yeah. submit a new one. We're not going to pull up your old one. And because things may have changed since you submitted that one as well, right? In your situation, and we've talked to you. And, yeah. Right. And obviously, um, it's a competitive process. We do read and look at everything um, that people answered, and um, you, if you didn't. If you applied last time and didn't get selected, maybe you need to consider uh, how you answered those questions. What you know, what we might have been looking for uh, that we weren't saying. And call Joanne and ask her. Call Joanne and ask her what kinds of things you might be able to improve on if you did it last time and are planning to reapply. And I know we had some libraries that contacted us. I remember who said, "I'm interested, but not right now." The first time around. Right. Now's your chance. <laughs> Hopefully you are now. Right. So thank you everyone and yeah. call Joanne for more information. Absolutely. There's your contact information. And you know where to find it. And go visit those library innovation studios. And you mm -hmm. can talk to people like uh, Heather and Audrey and others that have had mm -hmm. uh, had the library innovation studio or those who have it right now. Mm -hmm. Thanks everyone. Thank, thank, you. Right. thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. That will wrap it up for today's show, then. Let me get back out here to our website. Um, it will be on, um, it has been recorded for today. So thank you, everyone, for um, helping out. Thank you, Audrey, and Connie, who's left. <laughs> um, she had, as we said, she's on another meeting at the same time. Um, Max and uh, Julian and Mary Jo, thank you for being on today's show. Um, it has been recorded. It will be on our website. Um, if you want to look for our Encompass Live website, you can actually just Use your search engine of choice, and so far, Encompass Live, even Bing knows where we are, are the only thing that is called that out there on the internet, so you can, yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, this is our Encompass Live website where we have our upcoming shows, but our archives are all right here, all of our recordings. Um, today's show will be at the top of our list here. This is last week.
week's show. Uh, we'll have the recording. We'll have the slides up uh, later this afternoon, potentially, as long as YouTube and everything cooperates with me. It will be here, and I will uh, let everyone who attended today and who registered know. We'll also post it onto our social media, Twitter, Facebook, etc. Um, we do a search um, option here now on our archives. Um, this is the 10th year of Encompass Live, so we have a lot of archives here. If I scrolled all the way down, and I won't because I won't want to make them busy, this does go all the way back to our very first show, which was January 2009. So we have a search feature. You can search through all of our shows for um, uh, topics, titles, um, presenters, names of people, or just most recent 12 months when it's only something new. Um, so do keep that in mind as you are looking through our archives. Some of our episodes may be old um, and outdated information, um, expired links, uh, possibly things that aren't going on anymore. But we are librarians, so we archive everything, <laughs> and it will always be there for historical purposes. Um, so I'll take a look through there for anything else. So I'll let you know when the recording's ready. Uh, we'll hope you join us next week when our topic is, are you afraid of the big bad inventory? I know many people, this scares, yeah. Um, Tina Walker, who's the library director at King Memorial Library here in our Fremont, Nebraska, will be with us. Um, she's actually here at the Library Commission, she's going to drive down, um, to talk about how they did their first inventory in at least 20 years. She's a new director there, so she's not even exactly sure how long ago it was last done, and how they how they pulled it up. So join us next week if you want to learn how to do an inventory at your library and any of our other upcoming shows that we have here. Um, and Compass Live is also on Facebook. We have links to our Facebook page here. So if you're a big Facebook user, like us. There we go. Like us over on Facebook. I post notices of when the shows are coming up. Reminders here to log on the Fly Today show. Uh, when our, our recordings are ready, um, you can see them on here. So um, if you like Facebook and use it a lot, give us a like over there. Other than that, we're going to get back to our page. Ah, that will wrap it up for today's show. And we'll hope to see you in the future on Encompass Live. Bye, -bye. Bye everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for sticking with us. Bye. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you, Heather.